Hey folks, so for today's video we are looking at factors affecting flood risk. So this is in the river section of paper one, which is in section C of paper one. So if you just pop the title on your sheet of paper, factors affecting flood risk. Now we're going to break these down into two categories just to keep things really simple. Just have to line that. So if we draw, split your page down the middle, just draw a line straight down. Okay, and then on this side over here we're going to have our human factors. So this is anything kind of man-made or how humans have interacted with the environment to increase the risk of flooding. And then on the left hand side we're going to have our physical factors. Remember in geography physical relates to kind of natural things so we're going to be looking at our natural causes of flooding on the left hand side. Um, just to help you remember that if you just draw some, I always like to draw something because it's an infographic. If you draw some maybe some buildings on this side and over here we'll have like a tree or two. There we go physical factors and human factors. So if we start with our physical factors, um, the, obviously all flooding is caused by rainfall or precipitation as it should be known. Um, so we have to begin with that. So if we draw a nice big rain cloud with our rain coming out underneath. Now, if we just draw an arrow off there. So physical factors causing flooding. Our, the level of precipitation, that means how much rainfall, like the, how prolonged it's been as well as its frequency, that's what affects flooding the most. So if we write the level of precipitation, and we're talking about millimetres here, how much rain basically is falling. Um, and then the second one is the so, and also the frequency. Now we talk about frequency sometimes. We talk about frequency of tropical storms or um, frequency, like how often things happen. But the other big one is basically how, like how prolonged it is. How, how frequent are these um, storms happening or, or extreme weather events? So we've got the level and the frequency of precipitation. Obviously, if there's a high level of precipitation and a high frequency, the land is going to become saturated and that's, going to, that's what's going to cause flooding because it cannot absorb all that rainwater um, into groundwater stores and not flood. So rivers are going to be strained, they're going to burst their banks and so on. So yeah, so we've got our kind of, in brackets, prolonged rainfall. If you watch the news, you often find that areas that have flooded have had prolonged rainfall. They've had weeks, sometimes months of, of heavy rainfall before the really serious flooding occurs. Next up, we've got rock type. Now, the proper word for this is of course, geology, which some of you might go on to study at university, which would be brilliant. Now, just going to draw, because it's an infographic, we've got to draw our rocks. Just to remind ourselves what we're doing. So there we go. Now, you get soft rocks and hard rocks, or the more common term is sort of less resistant, hard resist, um, more resistant rocks. This just basically means that some of the rocks are porous, and you know you can get cracks in them which water can come through or if I just draw that with them um, dots meaning they can absorb water and that's what we call permeable okay rocks that allow rainfall into the rocks um, some other rocks are impermeable now impermeable rocks might be things like clays which don't allow water in and are not anywhere near as, as useful when it comes to absorbing flood water. Now we're just going to pop this underneath because it is important. So 
the word you want to remember is permeable. Uh, permeable rock equals a lower risk of flooding. And that's because the rock itself can actually ab help absorb the water. Um, now examples of that, if we just underline that, examples of that might be sandstone, which is a very permeable rock. Um, limestone is to some degree chalk definitely is uh, and there's there's of course there's lots of others but if you use those as your examples that would be great um, and then we've got our impermeable remember the im in it meaning it isn't permeable it won't allow water to soak into it okay so we've got our impermeable rock and that causes a higher risk of flooding okay so that's a problem and examples of that you, you might expect it to just be our, our hard more resistant rocks like granite but actually clay is, um, is, is very impermeable as well and that can cause real problems in areas of clay um, clay and granite. Now, if you, some of you might have granite worktops on your kitchen counters, it's an incredibly um, resistant rock, and yeah, does not does not soak up water. And then the last thing that's physical, that's you know natural, and um, is caused kind of by nature. If I just draw this, is the steepness of the slopes. So. Obviously, you know it's an obvious one, but the steeper the slope, the faster the the water's going to run off it. So that's the last one. So basically, rainfall. So we've got our rain cloud over here, raining. Um, the water that runs down the slope is called runoff, and it makes its way. There might be a river down here, for example going very ad hoc here but yeah let's imagine there's a river down here surface runoff which is what we call is the name for um, water that's running off down the hill to the river is increased the velocity of that is increased so it gets the river quicker which you might think is a good thing but it's not we need a nice long lag time we need there to be a uh, interception we want the water to get there slower we want it to pass through trees and over lots of land and give the river time to to accumulate water and move it on before getting it all at once um, so the steepness of the slopes uh, think about your case study here was um, Boss Castle okay remember that that was um, a lovely little village in a area of very very steep slopes and they had an enormous amount of rain uh, in 24 hours that caused a flash flood and so we yeah the steeper the slope the bigger the likelihood of there being a flood event so those are your physical ones i want you to remember on the right hand side we're now going to do our human factors and the first one we're going to do is building on a floodplain now i know you know what a floodplain is, but I'm just going to go over it anyway, underlining the word building, because it's human, so this is things humans have done, things humans have built. Now, if I draw, I kind of draw a line here, and then this is our river, and another line here, either side is floodplain, okay, and we can label that. Floodplain is the wide, flat expanse of land that basically is either side of the river in the lower course. The fact it's flat makes it really attractive to developers to build on because it's difficult building properties on hills. So unfortunately, what happens is property developers come along and build a, lo a load of houses on the floodplain. Just draw a few houses in there. Um, and then what happens is our river, which should naturally flood onto that floodplain, 
can't. Well, it does, it tries to, but of course it instead starts, if I've got, let's say a road on this one, um, that's like a road going into the river, it's not meant to be quite like that, but there could be a bridge, couldn't there? Let's imagine, I'm not gonna draw a bridge, let's imagine there's a bridge. Um, what happens is the river is naturally gonna flood and our road here and our houses are going to end up underwater. And that's not the river's fault, it's the fact that we've built on the floodplain. And moving on from that with our second one is just urban land use. So if you've got areas where there's high urban land use, urban means, you know, areas that are built up, towns and cities, um, you are going to have a higher likelihood of flooding. So for example, I don't know about your back garden, but paving over gardens doesn't seem like much, does it? Just one garden, but they all add up. Um, can have a huge impact on a, whether or not an area is going to flood. So if I show you, if I give you an example, so we draw our house over here. Let's have another house, a couple of houses. And this land has got trees and grass. And remember those trees and that grass, they've got roots that go into the ground. And when it rains on this area, this is a normal sort of area with lots of trees and, and, um, and grass, as I said, what happens is the rainwater infiltrates and it goes down to our groundwater layer. Now groundwater stores are deep down under the ground, but what happens is it gets sort of intercepted as well by the trees. That's called interception. Sounds like the name of a sort of uh, disaster movie, doesn't it? But it gets intercepted. Basically all the leaves catch the water and it just slows the journey down, but eventually it makes its way down to the ground, you know, maybe through the roots, but certainly through the soil and it gets down to that groundwater store, which is where we want the rain to go, because we can use that groundwater, and we can just, it doesn't affect anywhere with flooding. Now, on the other hand, if you've got a high urban land use area, you have the same rainfall occurring. Here's our land, you've got the same house, a couple of houses, there we go. Um, but they've paved their garden, okay, there's no trees, they might have some decking, you know, no, no soil visible, maybe some astroturf, that kind of thing. And what happens is the rain falls, as it does in the other one, it can't get through, so it stays on the surface, and that land floods. So it's really bad news because paving tarmac, I know most people don't have tarmac in their back gardens, but tarmac's used for roads, isn't it? But tarmac and paving are impermeable. So you just think about perhaps where you live, perhaps where the school is, what's the ratio of kind of green areas that can absorb flood water and rainwater versus paved areas and tarmac. Right, number three, just realise we've done numbers on this side, not this one. I'll just pop those in quickly. One, two, three, and four. There we go. And we've got four on this side, so that's perfect. Right, number three is deforestation. Again, I know you know this from uh, the Living World Unit, looking at uh, the rainforest. Don't often think about it in the UK, but that's because a lot of it has already happened or and is still occurring but maybe you're not seeing it happen. So deforestation is where you cut down trees. Okay, now trees are amazing. I'm always talking about how amazing trees are. But they have a lot going on beneath the ground without drawing masses of roots. They have a long, long taproot that goes really, really deep. And then they have lots and lots of other roots. Um, they're as big under the ground is the, is the way to view it as they are above. So if you've got, if you see a giant tree with, you know, huge branches and lots of leaves, 
there is as much going on underneath in roots as there is above. Now, trees, as I mentioned before, where did I mention it? They intercept rainfall and they store, they drink a lot of rainfall, so they will soak it up from the ground, hold it in their trunks, and if you used a stethoscope, you would actually hear water moving up the trunk like this. As it's, sort of, it's like drinking from a straw, it makes that sort of noise. Um, trees are noisy when they're drinking, and they drink gallons, litres and litres and litres of water. Um, so they're amazing for storing water. And it's stored it sort of in their leaves. If they weren't drinking it, the leaves would be all shriveled and, and, and dry. Um, when you deforest, of course, leaves cannot um, intercept the rainfall and the roots cannot soak up the water. So we just need to put that. Leaves cannot intercept rainfall and roots cannot soak up water. So trees are amazing. We just need more trees, basically. And that's not even looking at their benefits for, for climate change. Right, number four. Squeeze this one in. Um, farming. There is a lot of land, particularly in the UK, devoted to farming, which is brilliant. We love, you know, we want to be able to be self-sufficient and, and grow our own food and so on. But we have to recognise that in terms of flooding, it's a bit of an issue. And farming often tends to happen on floodplains uh, because it's nice and it's fertile land and it's flat, um, as well as in steeper areas. So the first thing I want you to think about is that farming often cuts down trees. And obviously for reasons we've already mentioned, that's not a good thing. Uh, not only that, farmers often remove hedgerows. Now, I know there's a big push to stop this happening, but a lot of it has happened already um, to make bigger fields so that they can be more easily um, farmed. Um, and the unused fields. So sometimes you see fields that aren't being used very well. Um, if they haven't got crops in them and they're not actively being farmed, then they can actually increase surface runoff. So unused fields increase surface runoff. Now remember, surface runoff, as I mentioned before, is the movement of rainfall um, basically down, uh, down slopes or across uh, flat, even across flat fields on its way to the sea. Um, but obviously that's going to happen especially on farms um, on hillsides, which again we've got lots of in the UK. So there you go, your physical factors and human factors um, that contribute to increasing flood risk. Hope that's helpful.